It's been a wonderful day up here in Suffolk. We've had drama, beauty, intrigue. It just hasn't stopped. Tonight, we're on the hunt for the badger with a taste for Abaset. Whilst our red-chested Lothario spineless sigh has been hunting for love. And single mum Sophia Loren just needs a break from the kids. I can't wait to see what happens. We've got badgers in the dark, we've got spineless sigh single mum, it's all happening. Welcome to the unfolding soap opera that is Springwatch. Yes, hello and welcome to Springwatch 2015, coming to you live from the RSPB's Minsmere Reserve, where it's been a glorious sunny day, but now it's become rather gloomy chilly. and a bit chilly. Very chilly. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's a fantastic place. Nearly 10 square kilometres with 5,000 species. And let me tell you, if you set your alarm clock early, this is what you can get up to. It's beautiful. It's quiet, just the sound of the birds. A real sense of serenity here in the morning. Hardly any people. The wildlife does all the talking. It's absolutely stunning. Fantastic. Just the sound of the reeds, the wind rustling through the reeds. Very beautiful at that time of the morning. I know that because I was doing my 10k run this morning at that yeah, time. Yeah, no, you sure. Weren't. I, I yeah, heard the snores <laughs> permeating <laughs> through the walls of the hotel. Found out again. <laughs> the reason why there's so much wildlife here is the mosaic of habitats. And of course, we've got our live cameras out there all over the whole reserve. If it moves, we'll film it. Let's go straight away to one of our live cameras down on the scrape. This is the robotic camera, the U5, and there are the shell ducks. A very large duck, almost goose-sized, beautifully coloured. The male has a big knob on its bill. I think that's a... Yeah, there it is, you can see it. A pair there. And as we've discovered, curiously, these birds nest underground in old rabbit holes, which is very unusual. You can hear there's so much activity on that scrape. There just, is. I mean, it doesn't matter what yeah. time of day, there's just noise going on, isn't yeah. there? No, it's beautiful. Very, very exciting. Mm. Now, if you're watching yesterday, you'll know that we've got a wily young stoat that hunts in the grasslands just by the studio mm. here. Now, it's a female, and yesterday she had a chick, and we saw her run off with a shell duck egg. Well, she's been busy again. Have a look what she's got this time. I mean, this is amazing. She's just about to pop her head up. Look at that! It's a huge chick. It is a crow chick. And she can hardly run with it. She's tripping over. Mm. Do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Yolo yesterday when he was trying to run with a tripod <laughs> and fell over. But look, I mean, she's really struggling with that. Probably weighs about the same as her. But interestingly, they can actually run with things ten times their size. Amazing animals. They're ruthless predators often catch rabbits as well. But, you know, she really is caching an awful lot of food. And that begs the question, yeah. why? Could she possibly Ooh. have kits? Down that hole. That's what we're wondering. Stop revelling in it, Michaela. I feel very sorry for that poor crow chick. But well, they're all soppy all of a sudden. Yeah, the poor thing. Crows are great. <laughs> if you've been watching over the last couple of days, you'll know that we've got our first live underwater nest. It's set up nest. We've got a live nest. We've got a camera on the nest as well. And the camera is set up down there. You see the island mirror behind us and the hide? Well, on the way up to the hide, there's a boardwalk. And underneath it is some very shallow water. And we've set up a camera there which is showing the antics of a three-spined stickleback that we've called Spineless Side because he only has two spines. This is a live camera at the there moment. There he is, there he is. He's in, in the back room. Yes. That's him. There he is. In Shy. The, in the murk. Come on, Sai, come, come on. on in. Show yourself. Come on. 
Well, he didn't show, but he's been busy all day. Now, the nest is in the centre of the picture there. It's quite difficult to see. He spends quite a bit of time in attendance, but then he does drift off and get up to other things, like finding food and looking for mates. So we've sped this up to show you just how much time he spends at the nest. He nips back in. He pays some detail. He's constantly sort of maintaining that nest area, as you can see there, chasing away anything else that comes in. But they feed primarily on midge larvae, so he's off getting a few of those, no doubt. And also looking for a female. He does a little zigzag dance to lure them in. And look, one arrived. Here she is. All he's got to do is get her in there out to lay some eggs. No. But she chases him away. And that's Disaster. the story of Spinus. Oh, she's back. She's back. This looks more promising. Look, she has a little sniff. Is it going to happen? At his nest. Oh, and then nothing no, happens. Not again. When it comes to love, Sai is a bit of a loser. <laughs> Sorry, no, he is. He's still, uh, he's still very much a bachelor, and as a consequence of that, he spends the afternoon in his jacuzzi. <laughs> what is that, though, Chris? We what think that it's bubbles? decomposing plant matter that's causing those bubbles to come up. But, you know, I've been thinking, what's going on underground? He's got his own little bachelor pad there. So, basically, this is, I've, I've imagined, so, you know, size love tunnel, <laughs> tunnel of love down here. I think he might have his own home cinema, where after dark he probably just watches some adult fish movies. I think he's got a, a midgery down here. He can stick those in the microwave, heat them up pretty quickly. And of course, if he gets lucky, he can uh, get into his revolving circular bed over here, in his bed chamber, after he's wooed the ladies with some wine from his cellar. <laughs> What He's gone completely mad. Can I just explain, though, this, the tunnel of love, that is what his nest is. And obviously this is all in Chris's imagination. We well, don't know, McKay. We don't know what's <laughs> going on. What's going on under the mud? Can I say, though, watching Spineless Side there, he's definitely redder, isn't he? I think he's getting red. And I, in yeah. fact, yeah, you're doing a bit of a, a spineless side impression. You see, I think his blue eyes. My blue eyes are not good enough. So I'm thinking, if I red, you see, the redder they are, <laughs> the greater the chance that they'll get a female. And they get that redness from their food, a particular type of food. And the carotenes build it up in their stomach. And the redder they are, the greater the chance of the female. So the redder he gets. Fingers crossed, he'll find a mate yet. We'll have to see. I think the big question is, will he manage to mate before the end of the series? We hope so. We're all rooting for him. We really are. Now, we were saying that there's so many important habitats here at Minsmere, and one of them is the Fenland, which is by the Scrape. And it really is a rich place for wildlife. Lots of nesting birds that are very difficult to see. What's not difficult to see is the predators above, the marsh harriers. There are about 15 or 16 birds on the reserve, and they, that is a very good area for them to look for food. But there is a live camera in the Fenland, and it's pretty difficult to see the nest. Let's have a look and see if you can spot where the nest is. It's well hidden in those grasses. If we go slightly to the right, have a really good look, see if you can see it. I say it's very tricky to see. You can see some of the bent leaves over there. If you look closely, you can see an eye. Wow, that really is well camouflaged, isn't it? What is it in there, though? Well, let's have a look live. It is a shoveler. Now, it's a medium-sized dabbling duck. I mean, there it looks very similar to a female mallard. It's quite dull. It's the beak that distinguishes it. The male is very, very different to the female. But it's important for the female to be dull because it needs to be camouflaged. It's extremely vulnerable being a ground-nesting bird. It is, and she doesn't just rely on the camouflage of her feathers. Look at this. Actually, she bends over leaves to make a little sort of green den above her head, so she's completely hidden. And you can see now, as she does that, the, the, the shoveler beak, that enormous beak that they have. It looks slightly out of proportion to their head. Look, there she is, hidden away from those prying eyes of the geese. Fantastic. Now, she hides herself away, but one of the most interesting things about shovelers is the structure of their bill. If you have a close look at it, there it is, very big, but it's, it's not the outside. Look at the sides here. When it's stoked. Now, look in. It looks like a lot of little teeth hanging down. They're called lamellae. And that's how shovelers feed. They take a mouthful of water, push the water out with their tongue, and that sieves out in the lamellae all the little crustaceans and things they want to feed on. Look, here's the male, and here he is feeding, using those lamellae. 
The tongue will be pushing the water out and all the little crustaceans will be trapped in his mouth. It does look a little bit out of proportion. The males are spectacular to look at. Beautiful bird. Now, of course, we don't know when that nest is going to hatch out. We've got no idea when the, the eggs will hatch. Keep watching if you can. The camera's on it 24-7, and you may be the first to see those eggs hatching out. We don't know when they're going to come. Mm -hmm. Here is a map of the reserve. I like maps like that. It's very much like approaching a map in a sort of military fashion. Let me just talk you through it. Here's the North Sea down here. Here's the scrape which we've been looking at on that live camera. That's where most of those avocets are, where we've just seen those uh, shell duck. Our HQ's over here. We've got our studio. That's where we are at the moment. But what we're interested in at the moment is the lives of the badgers that were here. Because if you were watching last year, or indeed earlier in the, in the week, you'll know that the badgers did go down onto the scrape and decimate all of the avocets. So we wanted to find out potentially who was the culprit and why they were going down there. So we've radio collared, we've GPS collared actually the, the badgers here at several sets. The quarry set are up here, they're too far away to be implicated in this at all. But the Warren set, we were looking at the badgers from here yesterday and we know that Milo, the young badger, was going out towards the scrape and then perhaps uh, approaching it from the seaside and we thought he might have been taught by his father Max. But today we want to look at another group of badgers that are in what we call the spinny set. That's quite close to our studio. In fact, it's about 40 meters just over there. And in the spinny set is a badger called Boris. He's seven years old and I actually helped put that collar on him. I've got to say, he's a bit of a geezer. He's like the Ray Winston of badgers. I've got a slightly bad feeling about Boris, to be honest with you. So I've been on his trail. On average, Boris is ranging just over two kilometers a night. He appears to have a number of favorite feeding areas, but one is particularly intriguing. It's a pathway that runs through the reed beds just west of the scrape. Dawn and I head out there to investigate. So Dawn, this is uh, Boris Avenue, as it were, one of his main thoroughfares. Yes, we've had masses of data from here. He really likes coming along this bank. We've also had uh, video footage from the camera traps of him going into reed beds and foraging in the reed beds. In the reed beds? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to try and work out what's here that he really likes. Well, at this grassy bank, this is saying potential earthworm to me. Where earthworms are plentiful, they make up a large part of a typical badger's diet. So I'm wondering whether the clue to what Boris is eating lies here beneath my feet. So the main thing we're looking for is obviously earthworms. Oh, here's a one. Very, very small. Mm. That's beyond, beyond the scale of snack for badger. Yeah. This is it. The sum total of my worming has produced this one tiny organism, which you can barely discern on the palm of my hand there. And at this point, I feel... Nothing but pity for Boris coming down here in the cold, the wet and the dark, scrabbling around to find something like this. It, it doesn't add up, really, does it? I don't think there's evidence that he's coming down here specifically for earthworms. We've drawn a blank. It clearly isn't worms that are attracting Boris to the reed beds. But perhaps we should be listening for clues rather than looking. Birds. Lots of birds. But this is circumstantial evidence at best. To prove whether Boris does have a taste for feathery food, we'll need something a lot more conclusive. For the last couple of months, the Badger team has been analysing poo samples from around Boris's set. Our badgers have been busy and a very broad diet. Yeah, so badgers are opportunistic omnivores, which means they eat a wide variety of plant and animal material. So this came from Boris's area, and this is a, probably a typical diet that Boris might be having. Dawn's forensic analysis reveals the remains of rabbits, amphibians, insect larvae, beetles, and lizards, but also birds. Possibly one on the neck of a wader or Wildfowl, okay. I would say. Avocets are waders, so is this the proof we need that Boris was feeding on the scrape last year? 
Well, those aren't have a set feathers, but as we speculate, we get a call from Jen at RSPB headquarters. So it looks like Boris came out of the set um, sometime between 9 and 10 o'clock. OK. Uh, and Boris has sort of appeared uh, on the western edge of the scrape area on the reserve and has spent most of that time between 10 o'clock and midnight uh, foraging around the western edge of the scrape. So he's forsaken that spit, as it were, that bank where we were looking this morning, and he's now moved over to the scrape. I suppose that makes some sense. You know, the birds are out there now. A few pairs are even nesting. A lot of noise going on. Yeah, that's right. And, and that sort of, you know, the listening and hearing, hearing what's happening on the scrape may well be a, a bit of a drive towards going in that direction, definitely. He's looking a little bit like a, a suspect mm. at the he's moment. He's in the frame, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. He's in the frame. I've seen the mug shots. I mean, I don't like the look of the guy, to be quite honest. <laughs> The evidence is mounting against Boris, but is it enough to make him our prime suspect? Now, of course, Boris is not a demon. Let's not demonise him. Boris is just doing what badgers do. And there are lots of other predators around here, including the one we're going to try and look for now. Now, Minsmere is particularly blessed with adders. There are adders all around here. Let's just have a look at adders and remind ourselves what they look like. Here we go. The uh, female adder tends to be brown and white. The black adder is a much darker. There, that's a male. That's a male adder, which is more sort of black and white. We're back to a female now. Beautiful patterns. They've got that zigzag marking down them. And actually, they're not that big. Only about 50 centimetres long or, or about 24 inches in old money. Now, I'm going to become an adder. Now, imagine, over winter, the adder spends its time in hibernation. Do you know what? It's not called hibernation, it's called brumation, because cold-blooded animals, like adders, do it in a slightly different way from warm-blooded that do hibernate. Anyway, I'm brumating. comes from the Latin, brum, for winter. Uh, I'm brumating here, underneath these logs, and then I emerge, and along I come, and the very first thing that I do is this. I get down... <laughs> and I start basking. I spread myself out to absorb the rays of the sun. Now, adders don't bask just to warm up for their own pleasure. It's a crucial part of their lives. But for male adders, like these, they have to bask so that the sperm, their metabolism speeds up and the sperm develops inside their bodies. The females have... Um, the females have their eggs to develop as well. Now, this is fascinating. When the males uh, are, are trying to find the female, like this, when they're trying to find the female, they, they actually fight with one another, like this. This is adder dancing. Very, very rarely seen. What happens is that they smell the female and they come along after her. And if two males meet, they'll wrap themselves round each other and they'll try and wrestle each other down to the ground. That's the adder dance. Very rare to see. I've seen it here twice, actually. Now, if dancing is rare to see, imagine mating. Now, I never thought I'd see this, but when I was here, literally on this path the other day, I met Jamie and Joe. I said I'd never seen adders mating. They said, we filmed it the other day, just over there. We said, could we use it, please? And they said, yes, here it is. Now, here are the adders mating. Again, you can see the male is the black one and the female, and they're joined together. And adders have what's called a hemipenis, the males. It's split into two. They have two penises. Adders mating, rarely seen. Now, after the adders have done their mating, they haven't fed, remember, all the whole of the time that they've been bromating. So now they're extremely hungry after mating, and they have to go out and look for something to eat. And we filmed this. Here is the adder coming into a goldfinch nest. Now, it doesn't look to begin with as if there's anything in there, but there are chicks, and I'm afraid they're just lying low. The adder can smell them, and that's it. Sorry, it's a little bit gruesome. That's a chick being taken out now. The adder has to feed. It, it doesn't need all that much. Some people say they only need sort of nine or 10 voles or chicks in there the whole of the summer to keep them going. Now, how do 
they move around these adders? Where are they? They're so hidden all the time. I wanted to find out how they move around here at Minsmere. And I got in contact with Darren Nash from the Durrell Institute. And believe it or not, the technology is so incredible now, the little radio trackers can be fitted onto adders. This is what we did. Oh, I like your danger sign on it. That's great. Taking no chances. So it looks like a female. Wow. There you, there you go, yeah. She's a good size. She looks quite stout. She is. She's, she's pregnant, as it were? Yes, I do. Yeah, she is gravid. She's quite calm, isn't she? Seems to be. She is Would still... you say that's a calm animal? Or... Yeah, well, to be honest, most adders are. Yeah. There's this impression that they're, a, they're sort of a monster. It's, it's simply not the case. Gosh, what a treat. Smelling there, tongue flicking out to taste the air. And the pupils in the eyes tend to make her look quite fierce. But as you can see, she's being remarkably calm. Very relaxed. We weighed her and identified her, and then it was time to attach the tracking device. Uh, and when you do this work, Darren, what scientifically are, are, are you looking for? What, what are you trying to solve? It's only recently we've started looking at the movements of adders, and it, recent studies have shown how far they actually move. That throws up the problem of development. What happens when a road or a rail or a house goes in between ah. the animal and its, its areas that it needs to either forage in or hibernate in? Of course. So that's what we're looking at primarily. With the tag secure, just leave her there. We release her exactly where we found her. And later that day, we radio tagged one more female and two males. There you go, lovely. Science in action. Now, we had one more tag left, the fifth tag, and we've managed to attach it to this female. You can tell she's female. Look at the, she's very, very calm. You can see she's smelling the air there. I'm wearing these special gloves which uh, would protect me if she was inclined to bite me. But look on the back, can you see? There is the tiny radio transmitter and that surgical tape that's holding it on and glow. And with this, we can actually track this female. I'm gonna let her go exactly where we found her. And let's let her go off. There we go. Go on, love. She's quite cool now because it's cooled right down, so she's a little bit sluggish. Anyway, when you come back, what we're going to do, be very careful I don't tread on her, when you come back, we're going to see exactly where all the adders that we put these radio trackers on have been moving around the Minsmere site. And it's fascinating to see where they've been going. Chris, Michaela. I'm really excited about this, I've got to say. Adders are one of my favourite animals. They've declined, you don't see as many as you used to, but to be able to put those little transmitters on them and track them around here is going to be absolutely brilliant. One of the, the best things I think we're going to be doing this year. Do you know, I'm very excited about them, as long as they don't go anywhere near one of my favourite live nests, which is the nest of a wren. We've called her Sophia la wren, and she's decided to nest in the production village. So it's a very busy place, but she's a very busy bird because she is a super mum. Let's have a look at her live. She's actually a single mum. We're pretty much sure she's a single mum. Our nest watchers haven't seen the male at all. There, there are five chicks in there. We thought there were six. We don't know whether we've just miscounted or one has died, but you can see they're getting bigger. This is them live. And, and you can see the hole going into that nest is definitely looking a little bit ragged. Yeah. They well, they're, are they're, pushing they're, out. They're eager for food, they're, aren't they? When they're eager for food, they stretch the entrance, which was originally quite neat when just she was popping in and out of it, and the male built it. But yeah, they're stretching it. And for on a couple of occasions today, they've actually reached out and been flapping their little wings. They but, were earlier, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, although I think that there's a few days to go yet. This is from earlier, and uh, she's been coming in with all sorts of different food. I mean, yesterday we saw her with caterpillars, with spiders, and with that massive dragonfly that she tried to get down one of the chicks. But it's constant, and she's a really good mum at the moment. And she's doing... Look at that. Yeah, that yeah. one. It's flapping. 
So it'll be interesting to see how many how many days it takes for them to actually come out. 23 visits an hour she's managing with all of that food. And on average, she's bringing in one and a half items each visit. Lots of caterpillars. I used to think that wrens were primarily spiders uh, and uh, crane flies and that sort of thing, but this one's bringing in about 50% caterpillars. Very familiar bird. But then there's another species which you'll be very familiar with because it occurs in 98% of our gardens throughout the course of the year, and there are 3.4 million pairs in the UK. It's the blue tit. And I know that many of you have your own nest cams. This is ours, live. We've got one set up here, and there's a bird in there at the moment Looks like it's rooting around for a faecal sac, perhaps. Oh no, a bit of brooding, because it's cooled down considerably in the last hour here at Minsmere. And that's the female. And she's in there brooding what we think are ten youngsters. Let's take you back a few days, though. This is the nest box in the wood. As Chris said, both parents are in attendance, and we think there are ten chicks, one little runty one. But as you can see, Every day they're growing. They're doing really well. And that's a view, as you say, that many people may have themselves if they've got nest cams. Indeed, and the feeding rate's much better than the wren. There, she's just acting on her own, but there are only five young. Here, both adults are foraging, but they've got 10 little mouths to feed, and they are much big, uh, busier. They're coming in about 55 times an hour. Now, we always used to think that blue tits deliberately tried to coincide their egg laying so that when they had chicks, they were at the right time to harvest a crop of caterpillars from the oak trees. In fact, we found that that's not the case. Their egg laying is independent from that, so they just have to get lucky. Whether they're going to be lucky this particular brood, I don't know, because the female is not looking too good. She's looking a bit rough, to be quite honest with you. We've been wondering what's the matter, but look at her here. We think that what it might be is that she's got too many feather mites. Feather mites are an animal that live on birds, normally in a symbiotic way, i.e. they're a benefit to them, because they remove all of the dead skin, any broken material from the feathers. But if there are too many of them, they can be a problem. This is what they look like. This is a, a feather mite. I'm not sure whether this is Proctophylloides stylifer, which is the one which normally occurs on blue tits, but you can see it's a relatively small animal. This is a, a microscopic picture of it. Um, they're, they're marvellous little things in their way, but if you get too many of them, then they can obviously impinge on the health of the bird. That's what might be happening here. That's why she's only feeding half as much as she should be. Well, I think the big question is, is she going to be OK? Well, you know, it's a tough thing. She's been in there, she's produced 10 eggs, that's tough on her resources, on her metabolism. Then she's been sat on those, not feeding as much as she would do if she weren't. And then, of course, she's been out now trying to supplement the food that the males bring in. The hope is that she fledges those and then can molt through a new set of feathers and, and pull herself together. I mean, she doesn't look too sick, she just looks a bit scruffy. She does, she doesn't look great, does mm. she? Her feeding weight has gone up. It was, at one time, it was seven visits an hour. Today, she's been in 19 times an hour for a period, so it looks like she might be improving. Well, the UK is a very important place for blue tits, and as Chris was saying, they're in a huge percentage of people's gardens and they're doing very well. But some of our other garden favourites are faring very, very badly, and they are in desperate need of our help. The nation's favourite animal nocturnal, slow-moving snufflers. They hunt for slugs, snails, and pretty much anything else they can get their paws on. Hedgehogs were once found in gardens and rural areas all over the country. But something's gone horribly wrong. Since 1950, 29 million hedgehogs have gone. That's a reduction of 97% and there's no signs of this decline stopping. So what's the cause? Farming practices have modernised and intensified. The hedges and small fields hedgehogs need have disappeared. More cars on our roads are bad news for hedgehogs. In urban areas, sturdy fences and walls block their path. The habitat is right there, they just can't get to it. We're sending out a Spring Watch SOS, and we need you to come to the rescue. A 97% 
decline. How have we let that happen? And if that continues, then hedgehogs will be extinct in the UK in 10 years' time. And when I say extinct, I don't mean there won't be any left at all, but there will be no viable populations left. Do you know, some people criticised for warning that there was a potential extinction here, and I, I, I'm worried about that criticism, to be honest with you, because if you look at the maths, that decline, was it 97%, 97%? is predicting that extinction. And if there's one thing we don't have any room for in conservation, it's complacency. We've got to stay on the case. We've got to act to help our hedgehogs. It's an animal we're all so familiar mm. with. As I say, how have we let that happen? But let's try and make a difference, and there are things that you can do that are very simple. Put water out in your garden for hedgehogs. They need water. Put food out. The ideal food is actually cat food. And the ideal thing to do with that cat food is not put it out in a dish, but put it out in a tube like this so other animals can't get in and take it before the hedgehog gets to it. And put out dried mealworms. That's another really good thing for them. But another very, very important thing is to make a hole. Are you my handy little assistant here? <laughs> make a hole in your fence. Because this is one of the real big problems for hedgehogs. They have isolated populations. So we want to make garden corridors through fences so that they can find mates, they can spread out, and we're not isolating them as much. Was I a glamorous enough assistant on that? No, you weren't, actually. I thought you should be in a few more sequins mm. and maybe a feather boa. Not for me. <laughs> uh, it's not all about Minsmith, it's not all about Suffolk. Uh, Yolo Williams has been out on an island odyssey. He's not anywhere near here. He's 700 miles further north in Scotland. He's left the mainland now and he's pushed out into the islands in pursuit of one of his favourite birds. Orkney. A group of islands only six miles off the northeast tip of Scotland, but it's a world apart. Made up of over 70 islands and more than six miles of coastline, the landscape is shaped by the sea. If there's one defining feature of Orkney, it's the sheer variety of landscapes and habitats for an incredible wealth of wildlife. There's one bird I'm looking forward to seeing more than any other. The Hen Harrier. We've just arrived on Orkney and I can't wait to get started. There's a lot of sitting around, a lot of waiting involved, but you, you have to remember Orkney is the stronghold for this bird. Uh, for many years they had over a hundred breeding females here. There was a bit of a decline in the 80s and the 90s but numbers have come back again and there's anything between 80 and 100 breeding females here now too so you've got a really good chance of seeing these birds up on Orkney and if you find a spot like this and sit down and you're patient you know you, you're virtually guaranteed that any minute a male hen harry is going to come over that hill. The first time I saw the birds, the first time I actually found a nesting pair, it was 1973 and I was 10 years old, and I still remember clearly as if it was yesterday, watching that pair, finding that nest, and I, I virtually danced off the hill. That's how excited I was. Like many other birds, for a hen harrier, spring is all about nesting. They are fantastic parents. Defending their vulnerable nests on the ground from any potential threats and ensuring nothing gets too close. She's got to look around continuously because you never know it. The male might come in behind you, you might come in in front, you might come in... Oh, what have we got there? Yeah, it's the male. The male's come in. Oh, wow! What a bird! The male has got to be the most beautiful bird of prey in Britain. It's lovely grey-blue colour with black wing tips and so graceful. 
It just hugs the contours of the heather coming down like this. What a stunner. What an absolute beauty. He's landed now. I can hear her calling. She's coming over from the left. What are you going to do now? Hello. She's gone off to chase him off. I think she's telling him to go off and uh, hunt for some voles. She's got to put on weight because she needs to lay these eggs and it's important for her to conserve her energy. He's the one that'll do nearly all the hunting. Hen harriers hunt voles and other ground nesting birds like meadow pipits. The male feeds the female by flying close to the nest and then summons her up to him for a food pass. She then flips onto her back to catch the food dropped by her mate, demonstrating their amazing aerial prowess. Wow, this is exciting. I wasn't expecting this. There's another female up here. The same male is provisioning both females. One of the weird things on Orkney is that females outnumber males three to one. I think the record is six females. That's absolutely amazing, but this one's definitely got two here. To attract a female, a male performs a spectacular courtship display known as a sky dance. Oh, well, this is more than I could have expected. It's like watching a, a ballerina, just masters of the air, masters of the air. I just couldn't visit Orkney without coming up here and looking for hen harriers. And having seen it, I think that's it now. My pilgrimage is complete. What a beautiful bird and such a rare sight. As far as I know, there's only one nest in the whole of England this year, but what a treat to see it. Well, that was Yolo's pilgrimage. This is my pilgrimage. <laughs> right. Remember, we have managed to radio collar five, five now, adders here at Minsmere. And I'm going to try, if I can, to actually track one of them right now. OK. That's a bit hissy. I'm worried that it's not on the right one. Oh, yes. Very hissy. I don't know if you can hear that. If I go away... I think it's picking up from the light. It's hissing, but you can hear it beeping. And as I get closer... There's a female adder right in here. Now, We've been tracking these adders for the past five days, and we can show you something absolutely fascinating. This is cutting science, this is. Now, the female that's just down in front of us there, she's in blue. That's exactly where we are right now. And in the last five days, she has only moved about two metres from where we are now. But the red dots here are a male, and he has moved an enormous, about 110, he did 110 metres here in a single day. So, for some reason, the females are sitting incredibly tight, like this one, and the males are moving enormous distances. Why on earth would that be? Well, that's because the female must now protect herself. She must hide here because she's pregnant, she'll give birth eventually, so she'll just keep, hunker down here and avoid predators. Um, and then the male, however, he's hungry. He's got to go out and, and feed as hard as he can now. Here's a male, remember, it's black. And they'll be out actively hunting. So he's out actively hunting. The females are not. They're just lying there and waiting for the voles to come to them. Let me card. <laughs> Thank you very much. So there's a lovely, lovely little bit of science. I've got this round my neck. 
We, of course, will be keeping track of our adders because we know that they like to go to the bird's nest. We saw that last year. There's a wren's nest over there, quite close to one of the adders we're tracking. There's a long-tailed tit nest over there that also is within the adder's territory. So we'll keep monitoring them. Big thanks to the Suffolk Amphibian and Reptile Group who've helped us track every day the positions of these adders. Well, much of our wildlife these days is inside our towns and cities. And who better to show us around the, let's get it right, the European Green Capital 2015 Bristol, my hometown, than David Lindo, the urban birder. You might think that cities are hostile for wildlife, but in actual fact, they offer a great opportunity. Two of our most successful urban birds are feral pigeons and gulls. I've come to Bristol for a glimpse into their private lives. Local naturalist Ed Druitt is taking me to the top of a university building for some higher education on gulls. Right. Right. So this is the breeding ground. It is, and if you listen, you can already hear one of the gulls. If you come through here, through this gap here, just be careful of your head as you come under. We have an assault course now, isn't it? The good thing about this roof is that it replicates the kind of island or kind of flat cliff face that these gulls might have. Their natural habitat. Exactly, yes. along the coastline. It might be hard to believe, given their presence in so many of our cities, but gulls are in real trouble in the UK. Herring gulls may have declined by around 50% in recent years and are red listed. Lesser blackback gulls are heading the same way. So our urban jungles are becoming increasingly important for both species' survival. How many pairs have we got nesting here? On this particular roof, there's about five. We've got both of the urban gulls you'd expect here. You've got the herring gull with the silver wings and the pink legs, still big gull. And then you've got the lesser blackback gull that's got yellow legs and very black wings. And if you come around the corner here, they light the corners where there's also a little bit of shade. Yeah. So if you look oh, over here, okay. here's a gull nest. And if we look a little bit closer, you can see there's actually three eggs in this nest. And if I just pop my hands on them, you can feel they're a little bit warm. If you pop your hands there, so we won't yeah, they're warm, keep yes. the bird off the nest for very long. But you can see that this one's been here quite a few years. You can see there's lots of other plants growing up around here from what they're bringing in. A little bit of rubbish entwined in amongst it as well. This, I'm pretty certain, is a lesser backback gull. These are quite a bluey colour. The herring gull eggs tend to be a bit more olive greeny colour. That's interesting. In terms of... The food, most people will think of kebabs and chips as a staple diet of an yeah. urban gull. What do they actually feed on? Well, you're quite right. Sometimes when we're up here and we're looking at the chicks, you do find kebab sticks sticking out of chicks very occasionally. They do regurgitate up bits of pizza. I've had steak regurgitated up. And you find wild things as well, small birds, for example, perhaps small mammals. But perhaps surprisingly, pigeons that we have here in the city. Oh, no, not the pigeon. I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid so. I must say, I'm very sorry for pigeons now. <laughs> to say pigeons and humans have history is an understatement. It's thought we started domesticating them as long as 10,000 years ago. Originally wild rock doves, they've been bred into many different forms. The ones we see in cities today are feral pigeons, descendants from captive breeds. They're everywhere you look. But one thing remains mysterious. The question I get asked the whole time is, how come I never see a baby pigeon, or even a nest for that matter? Well, that's one of the issues I've had, really, because they're nesting in holes in buildings, they're on top of air conditioning units, they're hiding away so they can't be eaten and their eggs can't be snatched by a predator. But we're here at a station, and actually just up here above the door, we have a pigeon sitting on eggs. Such a flimsy affair, isn't it? I mean, sometimes it's amazing that the pigeons ever get any eggs or chicks off, but the great thing about what she's done there is she's actually down on a little ledge there, so hopefully it means that the eggs that she's got, she's probably got two eggs, I imagine, uh, are actually quite secure. She's only just gone on to those eggs, so, you know, you've got a good sort of three weeks or so incubation before those hatch out into these lovely little fluffy squabs, which is the name given to a baby pigeon. 
and then they'll be in that nest for a couple of weeks or so while they grow their wing feathers and then they'll look like the adults. So whereas you have a baby robin and it looks completely different with a brown speckled chest instead of a red chest, if we had those baby pigeons in a couple of weeks' time, they would look just like mum or dad. So that's why people don't see baby pigeons, because by the time the pigeon hits the street, so to speak, it's the same size as an adult. Exactly, yes. You can tell spring's in the air. The cooing of frisky males is all around us as they strut their stuff. We just had a male fly in and he's sitting on a very rudimentary nest, obviously just starting building, and he's cooing away, trying to attract this little female here to the nest, who looks very unimpressed, I must say. <laughs> But so uh, he's trying his best. Seeing interesting behavior doesn't have to mean a trip to the country. And the wonderful thing about urban wildlife is that you can get so close to it. It never ceases to amaze me, the, the variety of colours that pigeons now have. It's incredible, isn't it? And the eye, wasn't that gorgeous? It was like a sort of a jewel. You beautiful. like the eyes, don't you? I you do like the eyes. eyes. Yeah, the pigeons are lovely. <laughs> David Lindo will be with us for Spring Watch Unsprung, which tonight is on BBC Two at nine o'clock, and he'll be answering questions about urban wildlife. But as David was saying, you know, you don't have to come to an RSPB reserve like this one to see birds, although you do see obviously a fantastic variety yet, yeah. here. You can go bird watching in towns and cities. And with that in mind, we've got some live cameras in Bristol City, which, as you said, is the European Green Capital 2015. Wow. And, and let's have a look at them now. Let's have a look at what we've got. This is the first one, and these are herring gulls. There are three chicks. It's, it's turned pretty chilly, so they've been foraging around, but I presume you can just that see they're one. under see the one? adult. You can just oh, you see can one just see one. There. Lovely sort of Do you model. know where they are, though, Martin? Where they're are on they? the roof of the maths department at Bristol <laughs> University. <laughs> so I wonder if they've been listening to some of the lectures. <laughs> she, looks, she looks very content, doesn't she? Oh, and this go. is the other nest. This is feral pigeons. Two chicks they've got. They're on the roof of the garden, roof garden at the BBC. And um, hopefully, I mean, you know, David was saying, people are always saying they never see baby pigeons. Well, Hopefully they might now be they will. Squabs. They're hideous, of course, squabs. Oh, don't be <laughs> so well, they are mean. hideous. They're tremendously. <laughs> What about this nest, though? Now, this is incredible. I never thought I'd see this. This is actually a swift nest. One of the most incredible birds in the world. It really is. This is live in Bristol. It looks very sleepy. It does. Now, let's try and see where this bird actually is, where the nest is. It's, it's actually on a house. Oh, no, we're not going to see that yet. Well done. <laughs> Here are, here are the Swiss. They are incredible birds. They suddenly turn up over towns. You hear them screaming. People call them devil birds because they scream. And they just look like little sighs, sickles in the wind. And they spend their whole lives in the air. They even sleep on the wing. And they drink, feed and sleep on the wing. That is a phenomenal, phenomenal, isn't it? Do it you know, never ceases to amaze me. I mean, I, I, I seem to never cease to be amazed tonight. <laughs> if you know what I mean. But no, I mean, that is just absolutely Do you know how they do it? I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. But radar studies have shown that they ring up, they go up high into the sky, and then they just drift around, and they shut down half of their brain, so that bit's sleeping, and the other half is still alert enough for them to avoid a passing pilot. Dolphins a... do the same. Do they? Yeah, they do. They shut half their brain down. I'm amazed, McCann. Are you? You <laughs> never cease to be amazed. To be amazed. <laughs> cease to be amazed. OK, well, let's have a look where those swifts actually are at last. And they're on right in the middle of Bristol. They come to our houses. It's great to put up swift boxes. And here they are, a couple. They seem very, very loving in there. One's even got its, its wing round the other. Can you imagine that they've got two eggs there? Now, when those chicks hatch out, if we see that, which would be incredible, the chicks will leave the nest box, they won't 
touch the ground for two years, they'll remain in the air. Oh, look at that. Isn't that though? wonderful? Look at the They're ring very round. They are. It's I lovely. hate to say this, Michaela, but it is a lovely, cosy sight, that, but occasionally, other males do come in and cause a lot of trouble into the Swift's lives. You've always got to bring it down, haven't you? Bring a negative I'm sorry, in. Mate. I know you want it to be lovely <laughs> and fluffy. Lovely. <laughs> but we'll keep an eye on them. It's such a privilege to see in the Swift. I never thought I'd see that. And you can keep your eyes on them on, on the webcams on as the well. On the webcams, yeah, 24 hours a day. Well, from suburban Bristol to the grandeur of a castle, both can provide homes for wildlife. So Richard Taylor-Jones took his camera to a rather lovely castle in Kent to film the wildlife that's made its home in the castle grounds. Warm Castle is somewhere that I've known all my life and I just wanted to take the opportunity to try and show people a different side to it. They'll always come here to look at the history and perhaps not think about the natural history that might live in and around its grounds. Spring's a wonderful time to do it because the castle has been sort of shut down over winter and yet when spring arrives, the castle doors are flung open, the rooms are put back together, and the grounds themselves start coming to life. The very first signs of spring for me is undoubtedly the frogs and toads. And I actually found one male frog who had climbed on board a female toad uh, in anticipation that his luck was in. It's quite easy to distinguish the, the frogs and the toads. The, the male frog on top has the yellow iris and the female toad underneath has the orange one. So it was quite obvious that there's been a bit of a mismatch with this pair and they made their way to the pond anyway and, and jumped in. The future probably didn't look that rosy for them. Once the amphibians have signalled that spring has kicked off, immediately my mind turned to the birds in the castle ground. Drumming woodpeckers is just one of those absolutely archetypal sounds of spring for me. They echo around the castle grounds beautifully off the walls. And as well as the greater spotted woodpeckers, you've also got the green woodpeckers here too. At this time of year, in the spring, they move about hunting across the lawn, sticking their bills right down into the lovely green grass, looking for grubs and ants. And if you're really lucky and you sit by the pond in the morning, you'll see them come along, bend over and stick their long tongues down into the pond and have a drink. The castle was actually constructed by Henry VIII, who had it built to protect us from the French and the Spanish. And you can see these cannons lined up facing the sea. Whilst the cannons did a pretty good job because the French and the Spanish never made it, if you actually just look round the corner, there is an invader, and it's the Spanish bluebell. They're a lovely sight to see, this huge wash of colour, but the truth of it is, these are invaders that have made it to our shores. If you don't know the difference between native and Spanish bluebells, all you need to do is just have a good old sniff of the flowers because Spanish bluebells have absolutely no scent at all compared to our English ones, which have that really lovely, deep, rich scent to them. But it's really hard not to actually just step back and enjoy Spanish bluebells. No matter how good those cannons are, this is definitely, I think, one invader that we're just going to have to learn to live with. With all the flowers beginning to bloom around the castle gardens, it's clear that spring really is marching on. And at the back of the castle is some dense woodland, and that's where every year the foxes set up home. And sure enough, just in front of me, my first little fox cub pokes his head up above ground. It really says to me, spring has arrived. New life is here. You don't have to have the rare, the big, the beautiful. It's those animals that we know and love that remind us that our seasons are changing. The castle may have been here 500 years, but that's 500 springs. There's a huge amount of natural history to be enjoyed here, as well as 
the human lives that have spent time here too. You just can't get enough of a cute fox cub, can you? No, they're one of my favourites. They are, aren't one they? One of my favourites. I went out for a walk today. I was hoping to hear a bittern booming, but do you know what I could hear? Well, Nothing more than the fizzma of the reeds. The what, mate? <laughs> Today's spring word. You thought it wasn't coming, didn't it's you? It's a bit late, isn't it? We're <laughs> Sorry, it's finished. It's F-I-Z-M-E-R. It's the light rustling sound of grass in the wind. I like Fizma. that. Fizma. don't you? Fizma. Gonna try and squeeze it in. We've only got a few Let's minutes. Squeeze it. We've got a few minutes. Now, last year's Spring Watch, an undoubted highlight was the bittern, and we've managed to film them again. Look at the bittern. Look at it. Now, that grass is probably making a bit of a fizma type noise. <laughs> it's it, a bit fizma ish And there's the bittern. Hunting. I think they're a sly-looking bird, Chris. Look at that eye. I know. It's got the bad eye. What's it going for? Oh, no! It's a stickleback. Could it be spineless Psy? No, stop it. No, it wasn't. Don't worry. It was just a regular stickleback. <laughs> right, OK. Oh, that's all right. Oh, that's fine, then. Beautiful birds, though. <laughs> People come from all around to see them. Very rare sight. We'll be coming back to them, Stunning of course, things. in it's the next stunning. couple of weeks. You're right, though. People do come to Minsmere to see the bittern. Sometimes they don't see them, but they'll certainly hear them. There are lots of booming males here. Have a listen. This is what they sound like. Let's hear it again. <laughs> And you really can hear that from miles around, about two to three miles. It's a very low frequency, isn't it? It is produced by an expulsion of air through their esophagus. Oh, Amazing, though. Fantastic. Now, Michaela, I've heard a rumour that you're extremely good at imitating the okay. booming bittern. Do, do you want to hear my booming bit? Here we okay. go, here we go. Uh, no, I'm sorry, oh, that was the donkey, 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 I get it right now. What's the ooh at what's the beginning for? What's the ooh for? What ooh? What ooh? What ooh? Step aside. What? <laughs> that was absolutely Stop rubbish. Stop it. I've lost it. I've a couple lost of weeks it. ago, we Stop. asked you if you had any baby boomers. Yes, if your kids, perhaps under 10, could produce a sound like a bittern. And you very kindly sent these to us. Here are our baby boomers. This is my imitation of a bittern booming, using Daddy's biscuits in. To prepare, I am going to become an angry person. Ba boom. Driven to drink at an early age by her parents' <laughs> desires to get her to replicate the boom of a bittern. They were absolutely top work. But if you think that your youngsters did do better, then send us a clip. That needs to be about 20 seconds. Try and get the sound right, and that would be super. Send them in, and we'll try and feature them in the following weeks. We are. Are we going to have a little look yeah, at a very, very what, special bird? Just last week, lots of birders flocked to Minsmere here to see something which is not only very special, but very attractive. It's a red-spotted blue throat. Now, these things nest just across the North Sea in the, uh, in the Netherlands and further north into Scandinavia, but they're increasingly frequent at visitors uh, at this time of year, these males. They've even come over here and started singing. So, potentially, they might colonise, and if they were to do so, it would be likely to be somewhere here at Minsmere because they like nesting in marshy fenny areas. What, amongst the sound of the fisma? Oh, Can I get that right? Oh, <laughs> Let's go quickly to a live... Let's go down to the scrape, the live camera, see what's going on. An oyster oh. catcher there. Lovely, cryptically coloured. Having a little snack, a little supper there. Nice, cold, muddy, wormy grubby supper. Again, you can hear all that noise. It's a real cacophony, isn't it? Yeah, a bird yeah. noise. Never ceases to amaze me. Never ceases to amaze you. <laughs> oh, my goodness me, my goodness Come me. On, Sadly, can. well, perhaps gladly, we've nearly <laughs> run out of time. Coming up tomorrow, the Badgers are quite literally at the wire, and we will probably uncover who was the culprit on the scrape last year. We're going to continue to celebrate urban wildlife with a fabulous film of great crested grebes in the city. And we'll be solving the mystery of why Stella Stoat is filling up her larder. Mm.
But do stick with us because Unsprung, Unsprung in fact, or even Undone, <laughs> is coming up just after this programme. We've got Vic Reeves on the show and also wildlife vet Matt Brash and David Lindo, the urban birder. So stay with us. It could be chaos. We'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. So we'll see you then for more Springwatch. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.